I want to do this as an interactive Q&A, so any, any question really that you have, I'm um, happy to, to discuss with you. Um, I can say what I'm working on right now, which is this book uh, on superintelligence, which um, will look not so much at the question of whether or how long it might take to develop machine intelligence that equals human intelligence, but rather um, what happens uh, if and when that occurs. Um, so if we get human-level machine intelligence, um, how quickly, how explosively will we then get superintelligence? And how could you solve the control problem? That if you can build superintelligence, how can you make sure that it will do what we want, that it will be safe and beneficial? Um, so once one starts to pull on that problem, it, it turns out to be uh, quite complicated and difficult. And, um, it has a lot of aspects to it that I'm happy to talk about, or, or if you prefer to to talk about other things, existential risks related or otherwise, I'm uh, happy to do that as well. But uh, no presentation, just Q&A. So you'll have to provide at least the, uh, the stimulus. Um, so sh do you want, should I take questions or do you want uh, to, I can, I can maybe it's easier for me to see. So what's your definition of like machine intelligence matching human intelligence, like how, how do we know, yeah. is there like a precise definition there? There isn't. Um, now, if you look at domain-specific intelligence, there are obviously areas in which machines already surpass humans. So, in doing arithmetical calculations or chess. I think the interesting point is when uh, machines equal humans in general intelligence, or perhaps slightly more specifically, engineering intelligence. <coughs> so, if you had this general capability of being able to program, creatively design new systems, there is, in a sense, a point at which if you have sufficient capability of that sort, you have general capability, because if you can build new systems, <coughs> even if all you can initially do is this type of engineering work, you could build yourself a poetry module or build yourself a social skills module if you have that general ability to build. So it might be that the either general intelligence or a sort of slightly more narrow version of that engineering type of intelligence is the key variable to look at as the kind of thing that would unleash the rest. But uh, human level intelligence, it's a vague term, and I think it's worth being aware of that, that uh, it's not necessarily a natural kind. Um, you, it's kind of a question which maybe you should have waited to the end, but you, there are kind of two organizations, Future of Humanity Institute and the Singularity Institute, working on this. Let's say I thought this was the most important problem in the world, and I should be donating money to it. Yeah, Who should I give it to? It's good, we cut to the chase. This is like, most audiences that would take a long time to get to that point, but yeah. this is not any audience. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a difficult... Uh, I think there is a sense uh, that, that both organizations are um, synergistic. So if, if one were sort of about to go uh, under or something like that, that would probably be the one. Um, if both are doing well, it's um, different people will have different opinions, but we work quite closely with a lot of the folks from uh, SIAI um, uh, as visitors and stuff like that. I'm working on a paper with some people from there at the moment. Um, there is an advantage to having, I guess, one kind of academic platform and one thing that is outside academia, the different things that uh, these different types of organizations are good at. Um, so if you want to say, get uh, academics to pay more attention to this, to get you know, postdocs to work on this, and uh, that's much easier to do within academia, and also maybe to get the ear of policymakers and uh, media and stuff like that. On the other hand, um, for SIAI, the Singularity Institute for Artificial Intelligence, there might be things that are easier for them to do, like more flexibility, they're not embedded in a big bureaucracy. Uh, so they can maybe more easily hire people who have a, like a non-standard background without the, the kind of credentials that, that, that we would usually need. Um, and also the more sort of the grassroots, like the, the community blog, less wrong, that type of stuff, uh, it's easier to do. So uh, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give the, the non-answer answer, answer uh, <laughs> to that question. Do you think a biological component is necessary for an artificial intelligence to um, achieve sentience or something equivalent to it? doesn't seem that that should be what it hinges at, 
to me. I mean, ultimately, I mean, so if you go all the way back to atoms, it doesn't seem to matter that it's carbon rather than silicon atoms. Um, then you could wonder if you, instead of having the same atoms, you run a simulation of everything that's going on. Like, would you have to s simulate biological processes? I don't even think that's necessary. I think, my guess, and I'm unsure about this, I don't have kind of an official position or a big world well of theory about what exactly the criteria are that would make a system uh, conscious. But my intuition is that if you replicated the computational processes that goes on in a human brain at a sufficient level of detail, where that sufficient level of detail might be roughly on the level of individual neurons and synapses, I think then you would likely have consciousness. And it might be that something weaker than that would suffice. Maybe you don't need to simulate every individual neuron. Maybe you could simplify things and still have consciousness. But at least at that level, it seems likely. Um, it's a lot harder to say if you had very alien types of mental architecture, something that wasn't a big neural network, but uh, a ab novo machine intelligence that performed very well in a certain way, but using a very different method than the human brain, whether that would be conscious as well. Much less sure. The limiting case would be a big lookup table where physically impossible to realize, but you could imagine just having sort of every possible situation described and uh, that program would just sort of run through until it found the situation that matched its current memory and uh, its current observations and then read off which action it should perform. So that, that would be kind of an extremely alien type of mental architecture and whether that would have conscious experience or not. Uh, even less clear. It, it might be that it would not have, but maybe the process of generating this giant lookup table would generate the kinds of experiences that uh, you wouldn't get when you actually implemented it, something like that. Yeah, here. Um, I was wondering, so this, the, sort of the notion of general intelligence, um, so is this relates to um, AI being dangerous, um, it's, it seems to me that we, while it would certainly be very interesting if we were to get an eye that was much more intelligent than human beings, it's not, is it so obvious that um, this would then necessarily be dangerous? I mean, even if the AI is very intelligent, it may be hard for it to get resources to actually do anything, it may not have, be able to you know, manufacture extra hardware or anything like that. You know, there are obviously situations that the amount of intelligence or creative thinking can get you out of or um, it can get you further capabilities. So, um, so I think it's true, it's not necessary that it would be dangerous. I mean, I guess it's useful to distinguish two cases. One is sort of the default case, unless we successfully implement some kind of safeguards or engineer it in a particular way in order to avoid dangers. Um, so let's think of just the default. You have something that is super intelligent uh, and capable of improving itself to even more powerful levels of super intelligence. Um, I guess one way just to get an initial possibility that it would be dangerous is to think about why humans are powerful, why are we dominant on this planet. So it's not because we have stronger muscles than other animals or because our teeth are sharper or we have special poison glands or anything like that. It's, it's all because of our brains um, and our brains have enabled us to develop a lot of other technologies that give us in effect muscles that are stronger than other animals. We have like uh, bulldozers and external devices um, and all the other things. And also it enables us to coordinate socially and build up complex societies so we can act as groups. And all of this you know, makes us supreme on this planet. You know, we can argue the case of bacteria which kind of have their own domain where they rule. Um, but certainly among the larger mammals we are unchallenged because of our brains. And the brains are not all that different from the brains of other animals. If you look at a chimpanzee, you know, it seems to be a small scale factor. There are other brains that are larger. So it might just be that all of these advantages that we have are due just to a few tweaks in some parameters that occurred somewhere among our ancestors, you know, a couple of million years ago or so. And, and those tiny changes in the nature of our intelligence then had these huge knock-on effects. So, just prima facie, it then seems possible that if a system surpassed us, even by just the same small amount that we surpass chimpanzees, that it could you know, lead to a similar kind of advantage in power. And if, if they exceeded our intelligence by a much greater margin, then 
all of that could happen in an even more dramatic fashion. Um, now, it's true that you could, in principle, have an AI that was, say, locked in a box, uh, such that it would be incapable of affecting anything that happens outside the box. And in that sense, it would be weak. Uh, that might be indeed one of the uh, safety methods one tries to apply when developing this, and it's one of the things I'm thinking about. Um, broadly speaking, you could distinguish between two different approaches to solving the control problem, sort of making sure that the super intelligence, if it's built, doesn't cause harm. So on the one hand you have capability control measures, where you try to limit what the AI is able to do. Uh, so the most obvious example would be lock it in a box and kind of limit its ability to interact with the rest of the world. Uh, another, the, other pro the other class of approaches would, would be motivation selection uh, methods, where um, you would try to uh, control what the AI wants to do. So you might want to build it in such a way that even if it has the power to do a lot of bad stuff, it will choose not to. Um, I think both of these classes uh, are promising and worth exploring at this stage. But so far, um, there is no one method or even combination of methods that it seems we can currently be fully convinced would work. There's a lot more development needed. Um, we could uh, talk more about this AI in a box scenario. Uh, maybe we can yes. come back to that. Then, do you want to? I was, was, was going to say. I mean, I was thinking of the situation. Maybe it's more analogous to. So, human beings have been very successful over chimpanzees, for example. But one feature of that that's been very crucial is, for example, we have hands. We have very, very powerful, and flexible hands that have enabled us to get a start on the, you know, the process of the tools and so on. And so, we might think if you had an AI that's just running on someone's computer somewhere then you might think that's more analogous to a very intelligent creature which doesn't have very good hands. It's, it's very hard for it to, yeah. um, to do, to actually improve itself and actually do anything. So you might think, well, the, you know, maybe we could make, maybe the box method is promising because if we just don't give the AI hands, i.e. You know, so some way to actually do something in the world, improve itself in some way, if all it can do is alter its own code mm -hmm. and maybe communicate informationally, you might think that that, that seems yeah, so one needs to be careful there. So exactly what you would enable it to do. So, so clearly it's not hands per se. Like, I mean, if, if Hitler had not had hands, he could still have been very dangerous. Yeah. Because there are a lot of other people with hands that he could persuade to do his bidding. And so similarly with the superintelligence, it might be that it has no direct effectors other than the ability to type slowly, letter by letter, a message on the screen that then some human gatekeeper can read and choose whether to act on or not. But even that limited ability to affect the world might be sufficient if it had you know, a superpower in the domain of social persuasion. Um, so if it has the engineering superpower, it might then get all these other superpowers, perhaps. Uh, and then if it were able to, in particular, be a super skilled persuader, it could then get other accessories outside of the system that could implement its designs. So there has been, I mean, you might have heard of this, this guy, Elias Yudkovsky, ran um, five years back or so, some series of role-playing exercises where the idea was that one, because we don't have the superintelligence, one person should play like the AI, pretend to be in a box. And then another person should play the human gatekeeper, whose job was to not let the AI out of the box. But he has to talk with the AI for a couple of hours over an internet <coughs> chat. chat. Um, so this, this uh, experiment was run five times uh, with uh, Elias Yudkowsky playing the AI and different people playing the human gatekeeper. Um, for the most part, people who were initially convinced that they would never let the AI out of the box. And in three of the five cases, uh, the experiment ended with the, the human gatekeeper announcing to the mailing list that yeah, I decided to let the AI out of the box. <laughs> uh, this experiment was run under the conditions that and neither party would be able would be allowed to disclose the methods that were used or the exact sequence of the conversation to sort of maintain a shroud of mystery. Um, but so this is a, where the human level persuader has two hours to work on the uh, the human gatekeeper. It seems uh, reasonable to be uh, doubtful of the ability of humanity to to, to keep a super intelligent persuader in the box indefinitely for that reason. Um, how valid do you think the idea of, 
of controlling essentially the mentality of the intelligence, the other alternative you suggest in terms of control, is um, with something that's at least as intelligent as us, considering how hard it is to convince humans to act in a certain series of, way reliably, series of ways reliably. Yeah, so humans sort of start out with a motivation system and then you can try to persuade them or structure incentives to get them to behave in a certain way. But you don't start out with a tabula rasa where you just get to write in what the human's value should be. Um, so that's a major difference. Um, <coughs> in, in the case of the superintelligence, like of course, once, once it already has unfriendly values and it's, it has sufficient power, it can resist any attempt to um, corrupt its goal system as it would see it, to change its goals from what it, the goals it has to something different. Um, do you not think that, like us, um, its experiences might cause it to question its its core values, as we do? Well, I think that depends on how the, the goal system is structured. So with humans, we don't have a simple declarative goal structure. There's not like a simple slot where we have super goal and then everything else is derived from that. Um, rather, it's like many different little people inhabit our skull and they kind of have their debates and fight it out and make compromises. And in some situations, some of them get a boost, like temptations and stuff like that. And then over time, you know, there are different things that change what we want, the hormones kicking in, fading out, and um, all kinds of processes. Another process that might affect us is what I call value accretion, the idea that we can have a mechanism that kind of loads new values into us as we go along. So if you, uh, and maybe falling in love is like that. Initially, you would not value that person for their own sake, above any other person. But once you've undergone this process, you start to uh, value them for their own sake in a special way. And so humans seem to have this mechanism that kind of make us acquire values depending on our experiences. Now, if you were building a, a machine superintelligence and trying to engineer its whole system so that it would be reliably safe and human friendly, then you might want to go with something more transparent where you have an easier time kind of seeing exactly what is happening. Um, and um, um, rather than having a complex kind of modular minds with a lot of different forces battling it out, you, you might want to have a more hierarchical structure, for example. Uh, I think you have been waiting, Art. Oh, uh, yeah. Um I was going to ask, what do you think are the uh, sort of minimum necessary um, prerequisites for a conscious mind? What kind of features? <coughs> yes, I'm not, not sure. Uh, I mean, we, we touched a little bit on that earlier. Um, and uh, I think there is this issue of... Uh, so suppose that there is a certain kind of computation that is needed, that's really the essence of mind. I'm, sort of sympathetic to the idea that something in the vicinity of that view might be correct. You have to think about exactly how to articulate and develop it. Um, then there is the issue of what is a computation. Um, so there is this challenge of the, um, I think it might go back to uh, Hans Moravec, but I think similar uh, objections have been raised in philosophy against computationalism. Uh, the idea is that if you have some arbitrary physical system that's sufficiently complicated, it could be a stone or a chair or anything, just anything with a lot of molecules in it. Um, and then you have this abstract computation that you think is what constitutes the implementation of a mind. Then there would be some mathematical mapping between all the parts in your computation and atoms in the chair, such that you could sort of artificially, through a very complicated mapping, interpret the motions of the molecules in the chair in such a way that they would be seen as implementing a computation. It would not be any plausible mapping, not any useful mapping, but a completely bizarre mapping. Uh, but nevertheless, if there are sort of sufficiently many parts there, you could just arbitrarily define some bijection. Um, and clearly, we don't think that uh, all these random physical objects implement a mind or all possible minds. So, um, the lesson to me is that it seems that we need some account of what it means to implement a computation that's non-trivial, and this mapping function between the abstract entity that is a sort of a Turing program, or whatever your model of a computation is, and the physical entity that is said to implement it, that has to be a sort of non-trivial constraints <coughs> on what this mapping can look like. 
it might have to be reasonably simple. It might have to have certain counterfactual properties so that the system would have implemented uh, a related but slightly different computation if you had scrambled the initial conditions of the system in a certain way. So something like that. But this is an open question, I think, in, in the philosophy of mind, really, to try to nail down what, what, what it means to implement the computation. Um, to bring back to the, I guess, goal and motivation-based approach to making an AI friendly towards us, one of the most effective ways for controlling human behavior, um, quite aside from goals and motivations, is to train them by instilling neuroses. It's why 99% of this room couldn't pee in our pants right now, even if we really, really, really wanted to. Is it possible to approach controlling an AI in that way, or even would it be possible for an AI to develop in such a way that there is a developmental period in which, I don't know, a risk-reward system or some sort of neuroses and neurosis instillment could be used to basically create these rules that an AI couldn't break? It doesn't sound so promising, A, because a neurosis is a complicated thing that might be a particular syndrome of phenomena that occurs and uh, in a human style <coughs> mind because of the way that human style minds are configured. Um, it's not clear that there would be anything exactly analogous to that in a cognitive system with a very different architecture. Um, also because a neurosis, at least certain kinds of neurosis, are ones that we would choose to get rid of if we could. Um, so if you have some big phobia or something and there was like a button that would remove the phobia, or you would press the button. And so here we have a system that is able to, presumably able to self-modify. Um, so if it had this big hang-up that it didn't like, then it could reprogram itself to get rid of that. Which would be different from a top-level goal, because top-level goal would be the criterion it would use to decide whether to take an action, in particular like the action to remove the top-level goal. Um, so generally speaking, um, with, with a, you know, a, a reasonable and coherent goal architecture, um, you would get certain... Um, convergent instrumental values that would crop up uh, in a wide range of situations. One, one might be self-preservation. Uh, not because necessarily you value your own survival intrinsically for its own sake, but because in many situations you could predict that if you are around in the future, you will continue to act on the world in the future according to your goals, and that will make it more likely that the world will then be implementing your goals if you have sort of more of that thing pushing towards the realization of your goals. Um, another convergent instrumental value might be, uh, indeed, the um, protection of your goal system from operation. <coughs> um, for very much the same reason, that even if you were around in the future, but you had different goals from the ones you have now, you would now predict that that means in the future you will no longer be working towards realizing your current goals, but maybe uh, towards some completely different purpose, and that would make it now less likely that your current goals would be realized. So if your current goals is what you use as the criteria to choose an action, you would want to try to take actions that prevent corruption of your goal system. Um, one might um, list a couple of other of these convergent instrumental values, like um, intelligence amplification, because you'd be better able to figure out how to realize your goals. Um, technology perfection, like develop more advanced technologies that enable you to realize your goals, and resource acquisition, general purpose resources. Um, so, this again relates to why a generic superintelligence might be dangerous, that it's not so much that you have to worry that it would have human unfriendly, in the sense of disliking human goals, that it would hate humans. Uh, the danger rather is that it wouldn't care about humans, it would care about something different. Paper clips. Uh, but then, if you have almost any other goals, like you care about paper clips, then there will be these convergent instrumental uh, reasons that you will uh, discover for why, if your goal is to make as many paper clips as possible, you might want to a uh, prevent humans from switching off uh, or from tampering with your goal system, uh, and b why you also might want to acquire as much resources as possible, including planets and solar systems and the galaxy. All of that stuff can be made into paper games, you see. So, um, so even with a kind of pretty much random goal, you would end up with these motivational tendencies that, that could be harmful to humans. Um, um, so, 
Uh, appreciating the sort of existential risks, what do you think about um, sort of goal, um, goals and sort of um, that such drastic methods of control, sort of A, ethically, and B, as a basis for a working relationship? Well, in terms of the working relationship, I think one has to think about that differently with these kinds of artificial beings. Um, I think there's a lot of um, our intuitions about how to relate to other agents that are conditioned on the fact that we are used to dealing with human agents. And there are a lot of things we can assume about the human. Um, we can assume, perhaps, that they don't want to be enslaved, for example. <coughs> Even if they say that they want to be slaves, we might, uh, we might think that deep inside of them there is a sort of more genuine, authentic self that doesn't want to be enslaved. So even if they have some prisoner has been brainwashed to wanting to do like uh, uh, the bidding of a master, maybe we say it's not really good for them because like it's in their nature that there is this will to be autonomous. Um, that might be other other things like that, that don't necessarily have to obtain for a completely artificial system, which might not have any of that rich human nature that we have. So, um, so in terms of what a good working relationship is, I mean, just as we think of a good working relationship with your, your uh, you know, word processor email program, not in these terms as you're sort of exploiting it for your ends without giving it anything in return. Um, if, if your email uh, program had a will, you know, presumably it would be the will to be a good and uh, efficient email program that uh, processed your emails properly. And maybe that was the only thing it wanted and cared about. Um, so having a sort of a relationship with it might be a different thing. Um, that was another part of your question uh, about whether it, this would be um, actually like a workable. Yeah. Was, Ethical to sort of drastically control another sentient agent. Yeah, so I think there are. So I think that it's not necessarily. If, if you're creating a new agent from scratch, and there are many different possible agents you could create, uh, some of those agents will have human style values. They want to be independent and respected and stuff like that. Other agents you could create might have no greater desire than to be of service. Um, and other agents just want paper clips. So, if you step back and look which of these should be designed, there's then the question of whether there are moral constraints on which of these it would be legitimate. Uh, and I'm not saying that those are uh, trivial. I think there are some deep ethical questions there. Um, however, in the particular scenario where we are considering the creation of a single superintelligence, I think the more pressing um, concern for me would be to ensure that it doesn't and destroy everything else, like humanity and its future. Um, now, if you have a different scenario, say where you have, instead of this sort of one uber mind arising, you had um, many minds that become smarter and smarter, rival humans, and then maybe gradually exceed, say an uploading scenario where you start with very slow software, and so you get human-like minds running very slowly, and then over time slowly getting you might then have this multipolar outcome, and in that case, maybe the issue of how we should relate to these machine intellects uh, morally becomes more, more pressing. Or indeed, the issue of, even if you just have one, but in the process of figuring out what it should do, it might uh, create, in my terminology, thought crimes. That is, if you have a sufficiently powerful mind, maybe your thoughts themselves will contain structures that are conscious. So this sounds mystical, but imagine that you're a powerful computer and um, one of the things you're doing is you're trying to predict what will happen in the future under different scenarios. And so you might play out a future by simulating a lot of people that would live in that future and see how they interact and what happens. And if those simulations that you run inside of yourself of these people are sufficiently detailed, then I think that they could be conscious. This comes back to our earlier question of what a conscious mind is. But I think a sufficiently detailed computer simulation of a mind would be conscious. So you could then have a superintelligence that in the process just of, uh, of thinking about things could create sentient beings, maybe millions or billions or trillions of them, <coughs> and their welfare would then be a, a major ethical issue. 
uh, that they might be killed when it stops thinking about them. They, it, they might be mistreated in different ways. Uh, and I think that, that would be a, an important ethical complication in this context. So, Eliezer often suggests that one of the main problems with sort of arbitrary stabs in AI space is that human value is very complex. So virtually any AI goal system will basically go horribly wrong because it will be something we don't quite care about, and that's <coughs> as bad as paper play. How complex do you think human value will turn out to be if we can sort of coherently work it out? It looks like humans are, human values are complicated. I mean, even if they were very simple, that even if it turned out it's just pleasure, say, which compared to other theories of what has value, like democracy, flourishing art, like it's like, in, as far as we can think of values, that's like maybe one of the simplest possibilities. Even that, if you start to think about it from a physicalistic point of view, and you have to now specify which atoms have to go how and where for there to be pleasure, it would be a pretty difficult thing actually to write down, like the Schrodinger equation for pleasure, right? Um, so in that sense, it seems clear that our values are very complex. Um, so there are two issues here, I think. There's a kind of technical problem of figuring out if you knew what the values are, in the sense that we normally think we know what, sometimes know what our values are. How could you get the AI to share those values? Uh, like, pleasure or absence of pain or something like that. And then there is the additional philosophical problem, which is, uh, if we are unsure about what our values are, like if we are sort of groping around um, in axiology, trying to figure out how much to value different things, and maybe there are values we have been blind to today. Like, how do you also get all of that on board, on top of what we already think has value? That potential for moral growth. Um, both of those are very serious problems, difficult challenges. Um, one, and so there are a number of different ways you could try to go. Like, one, one approach that's interesting is um, what we might call indirect normativity. Um, where the idea is that rather than specifying explicitly what you want the AI to achieve, like maximize pleasure while respecting individual autonomy <coughs> and pay extra attention to the poor and weak. Like rather than creating a list, um, what you try to do instead is to specify some process or uh, mechanism by which the AI could find out what it is supposed to do. So one of these that some of you will have come across is this idea of coherent extrapolated volition, where the idea is if you could somehow tell the AI to do that which we would have asked it to do, if we had thought about the problem for longer, and if we had been smarter, uh, and if we had, then you might add some other qualifications. But basically the idea it is if you could sort of describe some idealized process whereby we, at the end, if we underwent that process, would be able to create a more detailed list, then maybe point the AI to that and make the AI's value to run this process and then do what comes out at the end of that, rather than go with our current best guesses about uh, what we want to do or what has value. Uh, isn't there a risk though that with uh, coherent extrapolated uh, volition that the AI would decide that if we'd thought about it for a, a thousand years really, really carefully, um, that we would have decided to just let the AIs take over and become the new face of humanity, whatever you want to call it? Yeah, that seems to be a possibility. And then, <coughs> That raises this interesting uh, uh, question then, like suppose that, that, that that's really what our coherent extrapolated volition would do, and let's assume that everything has been implemented in the right way, there's no kind of flaw of our realization of this. So how should we then think about this? On the one hand, you might say, well, if this is really what our wise <coughs> selves want, what we sort of would want if just we were... Um, you know, saved from these errors and illusions that we're suffering under. Maybe we should go ahead with that. Uh, on the other hand, you could say that, uh, you know, this is really, this is really a pretty tall order here. Like we're supposed to sacrifice not just a bit, but ourselves and, and everybody else for for this this abstract ideal that we don't really feel any strong connection to. Um, I think that's one of the risks. But who knows what will be the outcome of this coherent extrapolated volition? Um, and there are further qualms one might have uh, that are that, that needs to be spelled out. So exactly whose volition is it that is supposed to be extrapolated? Uh, like humanities? Okay, so then like who is humanity? Um, like does it include past generations, for example? How far back? <clears throat> uh, does it include embryos that died? Uh, 
who knows whether the core of humanity is uh, nice. I mean, maybe, maybe there's a lot of sort of suppressed sadists out there that kind of we don't realize because they know that they, they, they would sort of be punished by society if they sort of, maybe if they went through this procedure, who knows what would come up. So it would be dangerous to run something like that without some kind of safeguard or check at the end. Um, on the other hand, then there is the worry that if you put in too many of these checks, then in effect you move the whole thing back to what you want now. Because if you were allowed to sort of look at the next extrapolation, see whether you like it, if you dislike it, you run another one by changing the parameter, and you were allowed to keep going like that until you were really happy with the result, then basically it would be you now who had chosen the outcome. Uh, so. It's worth thinking about whether there is some sort of trade-off or blend there, or a compromise that, that might be the most appealing. Uh, thank you. Uh, you mentioned before um, about a computer, you know, maybe producing sentient life itself um, in running a scenario. Um, what are the chances that that is the society that we live in today? Yeah, so what exactly are the chances? I don't know, I think it's significant, I mean, but, uh, um, um, but yeah, maybe, uh, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe less, I mean, it's, it's like subjective uh, judgment here, I mean, I maybe, maybe less than 50%, uh, but like more than 10. Uh, so, um, yeah, so th there's a whole different, uh, Different topic. Maybe we could save that topic for, for another, uh, possibly another time or something. The whole simulation because there's a lot that one can say just about that. If I wanted to study like this area generally, existential risk, what kind of subject would you uh, recommend I pursue? Like we are all undergrads, so after our bachelor, yeah. we will start with a master or go into like a job. If I wanted to study it, what what kind of master would you recommend? Uh, well, part of it would depend on your talent, like if you're a sort of quantitative guy or a verbal guy or whatever. Um, there isn't really an ideal sort of educational program anywhere to deal with these things. So, you'd want to try to get a fairly broad education. There are many fields that can be relevant. Um, if one looks at the, where the people are coming from who have so far or like had something useful to say, so they're like a fair chunk of them are philosophers. Uh, some are sort of computer science, some economists, um, maybe physics. Um, so th those would be some. And th those fields have one thing in common: is that they are fairly versatile. Like if you're doing philosophy, you can do philosophy of X or of Y or of Z, of almost anything. Economics as well. It it gives you a general set of tools that you can use to analyze different things. And computer science has these kind of, you know, ways of thinking and, and structure problems that are also useful for many things. So, it's not obvious which of those different disciplines would be best uh, generically. I think that would depend on the individual. But then what I would suggest is that while you were doing your ID fail, you would also try to read uh, in other areas uh, other than the one you were studying. And um, try to do it at a place where there are a lot of other smart people around and like with a supportive advisor that you know, encouraged you and gave you some freedom to pursue different things. Would you consider artificial intelligence created by, by human beings as some kind of consequence of an evolutionary process? Or, so, like in a way that, well, human beings try to overcome their own limitations and as it's, well, you have a really long um, time to get it on the DNA level, you just get it quicker on the more computational level? Um, so whether we would use evolutionary algorithms to produce superintelligence? So or if, if artificial intelligence itself is part of evolution and then we don't... Yeah, evolution well, process. so there's a kind of a trivial sense in which since if we evolved and we created it, then like obviously evolution had a, a, a part to play in, in the overall causal explanation of why we then get machine intelligences at the end. Um, now, for evolution really to exert some shaping influence, there have to be a number of factors at play. There have to be like a number of variants created that are different and that then sort of compete for resources and there is a selection step. And then for there really to be significant evolution, you have to iterate this a lot of times. So whether that would happen or not in the future is 
not clear at all. If you have a, a singleton forming, that is, if a world order arises in which, at the sort of top level, uh, there is only one decision-making agency, which could be like a democratic world government or an AI that rules everybody, or like a self enforcing moral code or some other thing, it could be many, or a tyranny, or a nice thing, or a bad thing. Uh, but if you have that kind of structure, then there would at least be the, in principle, ability for that unitary agent to control evolution within itself. Like, it could change the selection pressures by, you know, taxing or subsidizing different kinds of life forms. If you don't have a single thumb, then you have different agencies that might be in competition with one another. And in principle, in that scenario, evolutionary pressures can come into play. But I think the way that it might pan out would be different from the way we're used to seeing biological evolution. So for one thing, you might have these potentially uh, immortal life forms. That is, you have software minds. They don't, have, they don't naturally die. They could modify themselves. If they knew that their current type, if they continued to pursue their current strategy, would be outcompeted and they didn't like that, they could change themselves immediately right away rather than sort of wait to be eliminated. Um, so you might get, if there were to be a long evolutionary process ahead and agents could anticipate that, you might get the effects of that instantaneously from anticipation. Um, so, um, so, so I think you would not probably not see the actual evolutionary process playing out, but there might be some of the constraints that could be reflected uh, sort of immediately from the fact that different agents had to pursue strategies that they could see would be viable. Uh, yeah. uh, do you think it's possible that our minds could be scanned um, and then uploaded to a computer machine uh, in some way? And then could you create many copies of ourselves as those machines? So this is the, uh, what's in technical terminology, whole brain emulation, or in, in more popular jargon, uploading. Um, and so obviously it's impossible now, but it seems that it's uh, consistent with everything we know about physics and chemistry and so forth. Um, so I think that will become feasible, you know, barring some kind of catastrophic thing that, that puts a stop to scientific and technological progress. Um, so the way I imagine it would work is that you would take a particular brain, freeze it or vitrify it, and then slice it up into thin slices that would be uh, fed through some array of microscopes that would scan each slice with sufficient resolution. And then automated image analysis algorithms would work on this to reconstruct the three-dimensional neuronal network that the original organic brain implemented. Now I have this as a sort of computer uh, information structure in a computer. Uh, at this point, you need computational neuroscience to tell you what each component does. So you need to have a good theory of what, uh, say, a pyramidal cell does, what the you know different kinds of, <coughs> and then you would combine those little computational models of what each type of neuron does with this three-dimensional map of the network and run it. And if everything went well, you would then have transferred the mind with memories and personalities intact to the computer. And there is no big question of just how much resolution would you need to have, like how much detail would you need to capture of the original mind and actually to successfully do this. But I think there would be some level of detail, which, as I said before, might be on the level of synapses or thereabouts, possibly higher, that, that would suffice. Uh, so then, then you would be able to do this. And then after your software, of course, you could be copied or speeded up or slowed down or paused and stuff like that. Um, you have been. Yeah. Oh, um, there has been a lot of talk on um, controlling the AI and um, evaluating the risk. Um, my question would be that, assuming we have created a far more perfect AI than ourselves, is there a credible reason for human beings to continue existing? Um, yeah, I mean, so I certainly have the reason that, uh, you, you know, if we value our own existence, we seem to have a... a so, do you mean that, that there would be a kind of, whether there would be a moral reason for us to exist, or whether we would have any self-interested reason to exist? Well, I guess it would be your opinion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd, my, my opinion is I'd like to see, uh, the, yeah, I, I'd like to uh, rather not see the, the, the genocide of the entire human species. <laughs> uh, 
rather that we all live happily ever after. If, if those two are the two alternatives, I think, yeah, let's all live happily ever after. So, or I would come down on that. But by keeping the, uh, the human species around, um, you're going to have a situation, presumably, where you've got extremely, extremely advanced AIs. I mean, you know, leave it for a few decades, a few centuries, or whatever, far, far beyond our comprehension. And even if we still integrate to some degree with machines, if we're in any way going to stay biological humans, then they'll just be completely inconceivable to us. Um, so isn't there a danger that um, our stupidity would hamper their sort of perfection? Would hamper their perfection? Yeah, oh. hamper their... Well, uh, so I mean there's not space for there to be many different kinds of perfection pursued but I mean so right now we have whatever like like uh, dust mites crawling around in everywhere then not really hampering our pursuit of art or truth or beauty they, they're going about their business and we are going about ours I guess you could have a future where there would be a lot of room in the universe for planetary sized computers thinking their grand thoughts well it's, I'm not I'm not making a prediction here but if you wanted to have a, like a nature reserve with with sort of original nature and original human beings living like now, that wouldn't preclude the other thing from happening. But um, while dust might be like that hamper us, things like viruses and bacteria, yeah. despite being sort of far below us in kind of scale and complexity, um, and if you leave humans on a, or sort of you know, original humans uh, on a kind of nature of the, and they're aware of that, isn't there a risk that um, they'll be angry at you know, the, the feeling irrelevant? to kind of the grand scheme of things and lash out at the AIs. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, I, I don't think it would bother the AI, which would be easily able to protect itself uh, or remain out of reach. Um, now, it might kind of demean uh, the remaining humans, that if we are dethroned from, from this position, as if there are kings, the highest life form around, uh, that it would be a demotion, and uh, that, 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 that would happen, one would have to to deal with that, I suppose. Uh, it's unclear how much value to place on that. I mean, right now, presumably, in this universe, which looks like it's infinite, somewhere out there, there are going to be all kinds of things, including godlike intellects and everything in between, that are already outstripping us in every possible way. Um, so, it doesn't seem to upset us terribly. We just get on with it. So, I think people would maybe have to make a little, psychologically, I'm sure you could adjust to it easily. Uh, now, it might be that from some kind of per particular theory of value that this would be a sad thing for humanity, that we are no longer even locally sort of the, the, at the top of the, the ladder. Um, if moral rationalism was true, that is, if it were irrational to perform wrong acts, um, would we still have to worry about superintelligence? It seems to me that we wouldn't have. Well, I mean, you could have a system which, if you, you might not care about being rational according to that definition of rationality. Um, so I think we would still have to worry. Um, um, so, um, regarding trying to program AI with our values, um, so I'm not an expert in the field, so it's if I get strong, but as I understand it, what's considered one of the most promising approaches in AI now is more sort of statistical learning type. Um, approaches. So, and the problem with that is that if we were to produce an AI with that, those means we might not understand its inner workings well enough to be able to sort of dive in and modify it in precisely the right way to give it an, um, an unalterable list of terminal values in some way. So, um, if we were to, you know, end up with some big neural network that we trained in some way and ended up with something that could form as well as you would some kind of task or something, we might not we might be able to do that without knowing how to um, actually then alter it to have some particular set of goals. Yeah. So there are some things there that one can think about. One general worry that one needs to bear in mind if one tries that kind of approach is um, we might give it various examples and say, well this is like a good action, this is a bad action in this context and uh, and maybe it would learn all of those examples. Then the question is, how would it generalize to other examples outside this class? So we could test it. We maybe divide our examples initially into classes and train it on one and test its performance on the other. 
the way you would do it to cross validate it. And then we think, well, that means other cases that it hasn't yet seen, it would have the same kind of performance. But all the cases we could test it on would be cases that would apply to it at its current le level of intelligence. So presumably we're going to do this while it's still less than human intelligent or human level intelligent. We don't want to wait to do this until it's already super intelligent. So then the worry is that even if it would sort of analyze the uh, what to do in a certain way in all these cases, uh, it's only uh, dealing with all of these cases in the training case when, when we are when it's still at a human level of intelligence. Now maybe once it becomes smarter, it would realize that there would be different ways of classifying these cases that, that would have radically different implications for humans. Um, so, um, so suppose that you try to train it to, um, you know, and this was sort of the, one of the classic examples of like a bad idea for how to solve the, uh, uh, the control problem. So like, let's, let's, let's train the AI to want to make people smile. What can go wrong with that? Um, so we train it on like different people. If, if, they, if they smile when it does something, that's like a kind of uh, a reward that I don't know that gets strengthened. Those dispositions that led to the behavior that made people smile and um, frowning, I guess, would be sort of would be move the AI away from that kind of behavior. And you could imagine that this would work pretty well um, at, at the primitive stage, where, where the AI would engage in more pleasing and useful behavior because then the user will smile at it and and it will all work very well. But then once the AI reaches a certain level of intellectual sophistication, it might realize that it could get people to smile, not just by being nice, but also by paralyzing their facial muscles in a sort of constant <laughs> beaming smile. Um, and then there would be this perverse instantiation of the constant values. So all along the value that it had learned was to make people smile, but the kinds of behaviors that it would pursue to achieve this goal would suddenly radically change at a certain point once this new set of strategies became available to it. Um, and you would get this treacherous turn, um, which would be dangerous. So, that's not to dismiss that whole category of approaches altogether. The, one, one, the same one would have to think through quite carefully exactly how one would go about that. Um, there is also the issue of a lot of the things that we would want it to learn, if we think of human values and ambitions and goals and plans, they are sort of, ex we, we think of them in using human uh, concepts. Uh, not, not using sort of basic physical, like, place atom A to Z in a certain order, but we think like, you know, promote peace, you know, like encourage people to develop and achieve. These are things that, to understand them, you really need to have human concept, which a subhuman AI will not have. It's too dumb at that stage to have them. Um, now, once it's super intelligent, it might easily understand all human concepts, but then it's too late. Like, it already needs to be friendly before that. So, uh, there might only be this sort of brief window of opportunity when it's roughly human level, where it's still safe enough not to not not to sort of resist our attempts to uh, indoctrinate it, but still smart enough that it can actually understand what we're trying to tell it. And again, one wouldn't have to be very careful to to make sure that we could sort of bring the system up to that interval and then freeze its development there, and then try to lower the values in before bootstrapping it further. Um, and maybe, again, I mean, this was one of the first questions, maybe its intelligence will not be human level in the sense of being very similar to a human at any one point. Maybe it will immediately become very good at chess, but very bad at poetry, and then it has to reach sort of radically superhuman levels of capability in some domains before other domains even reach human level. And in that case, it's not even clear that there will be this sort of window of opportunity where, where, where you could load in the values. So, um, so that, that's not, I don't want to sort of dismiss that, but that, that's like some additional things that one needs to think about if one tries to develop that. I think all the way back. How likely is it that we will have the opportunity in our lifetimes to become immortal by a mind uploading? <laughs> um, well, so first of all, by immortal here we mean, I guess, living for a very long time rather than yeah. literally never dying, which is a very different thing that would require our best theories of cosmology to turn out to be false and stuff like that. Um, so, living for a very long time, I mean, uh, I, I'm not going to give you a probability in the end, but I can say some of the things that, so first we would have to avoid most kinds of existential catastrophe that could put an end to this. So, 
I guess you would first subtract, if you, if you start with sort of 100% and then you remove all the things that could go wrong. Uh, so first you would have to throw away, you know, pretty much whatever you think the total level of existential risk is integrated over all time. Um, then um, there is the obvious risk that you will sort of die uh, before any of this happens, which seems to be a very substantial risk. Uh, now you could reduce that by signing up for a chronix, but uh, that's of course uh, an uncertain business as well. There could be sub-existential catastrophes that, that would put an end to a lot of things, like a big nuclear war or pandemics and stuff like that. Um, and then I guess there are all these situations in which um, not everybody who were still around uh, got the opportunity to participate in what came after, even though what came after doesn't count as an existential catastrophe. Um, so that, that might also be... So, it, it seems... Um, and, and then even more complicated, like if you take into account the simulation hypothesis or whatever, which we decided not to talk about today, but... Is there uh, a particular year we should aim for? <laughs> I think, uh, as for the timelines, you know, really, uh, truth is we don't know. So you need to think about a very sort of smeared out probability distribution. And, and really smear it, that, you know, things could happen surprisingly sooner, like some probability 10 years from now, 20 years, but, you know, probably more probability uh, 30, 40, 50 years, than some probability 80 years or 200 years, like, uh, there's just no good evidence that human beings are very good at predicting with precision these kinds of things far out into the future. Kind of related to my first question is that how intelligent can we really get? So, if we assume that we are already doing machine based, and then we already have this complexity class of problems that we can solve and not, and like we might make this, is it fair to assume that the super intelligent machine can actually be like exponentially intelligent? Like maybe it's maybe we reach human level intelligence and we say, oh, this is very close to what we could achieve in terms of intelligence. It's kind yeah. of related to the definition of intelligence also, but well, so I mean, we are in a sense. In, in a sort of cheaty sense, we could solve all problems, probably that the super intelligent, like everything that the Turing machine could do. I mean, you could take like a piece of paper and start to, uh, A, it would take too long to actually do it. Um, and if we tried to do it, there would be things that would probably throw us off before we had completed any sort of big Turing machine simulation. So, there is a less, less sort of um, Pickwickian sense in which our abilities are already indirectly unlimited. That is, if we have the ability to create the superintelligence, then in a sense we can do everything because we can create this thing that then solves the thing that we want solved. So it's a sequence of steps that we have to go through with the end result. So there is this um, level of capability which might mean that once you have that level of capability, your reach, your indirect reach, is universal. Like anything that could be done, you could indirectly achieve. Um, and we might already have surpassed that level uh, a long time ago, save for the fact that we are sort of uncoordinated on a global level and maybe a little bit unwise. But if you had had a wise single phone, uh, then certainly you could imagine us just plotting a very safe course, taking it slowly, and in, in the end we could be pretty confident that we would get to the, the end result there. Um, but maybe not, the, no, no, neither of those like ideas what would you had in mind. Maybe you had more in mind the question of just how smart are in, in the sort of everyday sense of smart could a, a machine be? Like just how much more effective at social persuasion to take one particular thing than the most persuasive human being. So that, that we don't really know. Um, if, if one has a distribution of human abilities and it seems that the best humans can do a lot better in our intuitive sense of a lot than the average humans, then it would seem very surprising if, if the best humans, like the top, you know, tenth of a percent, had just reached sort of the upper limit of what was technologically feasible. That, that would seem to be an amazing coincidence. Um, so one would then expect uh, sort of the, the, the maximum achievable to be a lot higher. Uh, but exactly how high, we don't know. Um, how are we doing? So two more questions I have time for, yeah. Um, Okay, well, do your first as a follow-up, and then anybody can think if they want to. So, 
Right, like just like we are worrying about super intelligent being, it's quite likely that super intelligent being will start worrying about. Is it possible that that guy will also worry about another super intelligent being that it will be? Isn't that also recursive? Yeah, so it is recursive. Well, so you could consider one scenario in which the, uh, one AI designs another artificial intelligence that's smarter, and then that designs another. But it might not be clearly distinguishable from the scenario where you have one AI that modifies itself so that it ends up smart. Like whether you call it the same or different, yeah. it, it might be kind of an unimportant difference. Um, okay, so last question. Who wants to have a go? Okay, so this has to be a, a super profound question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my question is why should we try to even build a super Well, I don't think we should now um, do that, but plus, if, if it took a step back and, and, and you sort of say, what, what would the sane species do? Well, they would first figure out how to solve the control problem, and then they would think about that for a while to make sure that they really had the solution right and they hadn't just deluded themselves to have solved it. And then maybe they would build a super intelligence. Um, so that's what the sane species would do. Now, what humanity will do is try to do everything <laughs> they can as quickly as possible. Uh, so there are people who have tried to build it uh, as we speak. Uh, in, in a number of different places on Earth. Unfortunately, it looks very difficult to build it with current technology, but of course it's getting easier over time. Computers get better. Computer science, the state of the art, advances. We learn more about how the human brain works. So every year uh, it gets a little bit easier from some unknown, very difficult level. It uh, gets easier and easier. So at some point, so, so somebody will probably succeed in doing it. If the world remains kind of coordinated and uncontrolled as it is now, it's bound to happen uh, soon after it becomes feasible. Um, but um, um, we have no reason to accelerate that even more uh, than, than it's already happening. Um, so, so somebody said yeah, the other day, like, so what, what's the, like, a, like a, so we were thinking about what, what would like a powerful uh, AI thing do that just come into existence and it didn't know very much yet but it had a lot of clever algorithms and um, a lot, lot of processing power and then somebody was suggesting maybe it would sort of move around randomly like uh, uh, like a human baby does to kind of figure out how to how, how things move, how it can move its actuators and stuff like that and then we had a discussion whether that was a wise thing or not. But, but if you think about how the human species behave, we are really behaving very much like a baby. We're sort of basically moving and shaking around anything that moves just to see what happens. Um, and the risk is that we are not like in a nursery uh, with like a kind mother who has put us in a safe cradle, but that we're out in the jungle somewhere screaming at the top of our lungs and maybe just alerting the lions to uh, a supper. Um, all right, so let's wrap up there. I enjoyed this a great deal, so thank you all for your great questions. Thank you.